Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our very first Leaders Eat Last panel series. My name is Anne-Marie Doherty, and I'm the CEO of the Bob Woodruff Foundation. Thank you to our esteemed panelists for joining us for this urgent discussion. For those of you who are tuning in and meeting the Bob Woodruff Foundation for the first time, we've spent the past 15 years investing more than $76 million in creating healthy, positive futures for veterans and their families. We invest time and resources in listening to the military and veteran community so we can understand the most pressing issues they face, then prioritize and help address them. Through our grantees and local partners, we reach over 11 million veterans and families in hundreds of communities across the country. Early in 2020, the Bob Woodruff Foundation reacted to COVID-19 swiftly by investing against needs we knew were going to grow employment services, mental health resources, and emergency financial aid. As we continued to listen to our network, we heard about an emerging and pervasive issue, food insecurity. Around that same time, our board member and my very good friend, Craig Newmark, came to us with an idea. He was investing big in food insecurity to tune of $10 million, and he had convened a group of expert partners including DC Central Kitchen, Fair Start, Feeding America, God's Love We Deliver, Second Harvest of Silicon Valley, and World Central Kitchen. Craig and I saw an opportunity to join forces to shift the tide of hunger in America, and we're already making an impact. Of that initial $10 million, Craig Newmark Philanthropies has deployed almost all of it just recently, Craig invested $150,000 in Dreaming Out Loud, a nonprofit dedicated to creating economic opportunities for the DC metro region's marginalized communities through building a healthy, equitable food system. To date, the Bob Woodruff Foundation has invested over $500,000 to address food insecurity in the military and veteran community with more grants to come. But we recognize that this is no simple challenge. We need to share knowledge, resources, and best practices to tackle the problem with a collaborative systems-oriented approach, which is why we are gathered here today for the, for the first session in our new panel series, Leaders Eat Last, named for the selfless approach of our military leaders who so often put the needs of others before their own. It's an admirable quality and service, but when veterans come home, they shouldn't have to continue to sacrifice when it comes to their well-being. To everyone tuning in today, and I think we have over 500 people with us today, so thank you. We each have a role to play in fighting food insecurity. Together, we have the opportunity to drive real change for millions of Americans, letting them know we've got their six through this pandemic and beyond. Now I have the pleasure to welcome Craig Newmark, who inspired us to lean into this increasingly important conversation. So over to you, Craig. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, for years, I've been aware that there's a hunger problem in our country, but the pandemic and resulting economic collateral damage has made it much worse. 
And in particular, it's made it much worse for veterans and their families. And frankly, that uh, pisses me off, which is to say, I take it personally. So I worked with Bob Woodruff Foundation and Got Your Six to bring together some of the organizations across our country who are really good at their job, good at getting people fed, not only today, but in subsequent days and weeks and months. The goal was simple, get people fed today, tomorrow, and then let's figure out how to get people fed for the long term. Easy to say, really hard to do. So, uh, well, I feel a nerd's got to do what a nerd's got to do. I started putting in uh, 10 million to help out with that. But then I think I got to put my money where my mouth is. So I'm announcing right now, I'm adding another 15 million to round it up to 25 million. Since as a nerd, I like round numbers. I'm no expert in any of this. It really should require someone who has what people who are not nerds call social skills. But I can do my part trying to raise awareness or having people with social skills try to raise awareness. And then we get the cash to the organizations who are making a real difference because they're good at their job. Speaking of people who are good at their job, and I'm tempted to make a joke here, but I won't. I'm proud to introduce our moderator for today, ABC reporter, co-founder of Bob Woodruff Foundation, and my friend who will hopefully tolerate my sense of humor, Bob Woodruff. He's been on the front lines of serious reporting, actual reporting of the big issues of our generation being Im embedded with US forces in Iraq to spending over a year tracking things like the development of COVID vaccines. Bob, thanks for being here to lead what's really an important discussion. Thanks, everyone. Signing off. <laughs> Affirmative. Craig, I, well, first of all, how do, I follow, how do I follow that announcement? Another $15 million. I have to say, everybody needs to know that Craig Newmark, you know, from Craig's List, uh, is Okay, I'll admit he's kind of a nerd. He's actually admitted that several times to us. In fact, if, if anybody saw Stand Up for Heroes on online this year, you can see he's got a whole rig, you know, whole whole you know show, act that he talks all about it. Anyways, the greatest, most generous man I think that helping the veterans that we have in this country almost. I mean, he is done more. Craig, I just can't thank you enough for what you've done. You are a very special man in our soul. So, thank you for that. I also want to give a, uh, a big, hello. <laughs> we got to do some kind of, uh, yeah. we got to do some other signals you know, later on for our, our, our secret uh, signals out there. But uh, anyway, thank you again, Craig, for that. I just want to say uh, a big thank you to and an introduction for, for our panelists that we have today. This is going to be uh, a group of four that are, I would say, the top experts on this subject that we're going to talk today both from the, the perspective of the, of the military, but also, also from the science about how to deal with this and certainly the political way to get rid of this. I want to introduce first Dr. Molly John, who is a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She is also uh, really on loan for right now with, with DARPA. If anybody knows what DARPA is, it's the Defense Advanced Research um, Pro uh, Project Agency. Uh, Wood has, uh, if you know any of the history of it, it was uh, created because of Russia, the Soviets sending to go into the to the to uh, to the sky to the to space before we did. We had to create something, and also uh, it, it claims that it invented uh, it actually made the internet. It wasn't Al Gore apparently. It was, it was DARPA. So I want to thank, uh, which I should say too, because I'm able to joke because Molly is actually my my cousin, and really my. The sister I never had because I've all I got is three brothers. I also want to thank Catherine Monet, who's the CEO of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. Shannon uh, Residen, who's the president and executive director of Military Family Advisory Network. And then also Kathy Roth Duque, who's the CEO of Blue Star Families. 
um, is with us here also today. And I also, you know, our, our discussion here today is also going to with, uh, with Dr. Meg Harrell, who is our chief program officer at the uh, Bob Woodard Foundation, who has been with us for, I think, almost a decade now. She's, uh, she's remarkable. So I want to start at the top of this, because this is the topic that we really need to try to find some type of solution with this and to, and to spell it out so the people that are watching this right now, which I believe are hundreds of people, um, I want to start with uh, with Molly because you are, uh, people should know, one of the most, uh, one of the nation's, per the top expert in terms of, of hunger and food around the world, not just in the United States. But, you know, the words that sometimes we, we hear when you talk, Molly, are the words food security and hunger. How do those words two go together? So hunger is, first I should say, wow, what a stunning announcement from Craig Newmark. Wow. And Bob and I have a joke in our family, nerds rule. Right, Bob? <laughs> What's it, you're, you're a PhD. You, you, already, you already qualify for it, yes. <laughs> If you saw him with his thick glasses, you'd know that, that we're the <laughs> With tape in the middle. <laughs> uh, so, wow. Thank you, Craig. What an amazing announcement. Um, and what an urgent problem. Uh, it was a disgrace in this nation before COVID. And after COVID, the condition of food insecurity in the United States has increased tremendously. Uh, so this is very timely and very important. It's an issue for veterans and their families and communities, and it's an issue for military families. Uh, and I'm, you'll hear more about that uh, later in the panel. But uh, hunger is a word we hear a lot, and it actually means that feeling of personal discomfort when you need your lunch. Um, and it is a widespread concern when people cannot get the food they need when their bodies signal they need it. And so the term food insecurity is a word that describes when food is not available, accessible, affordable, or consistently or reliably um, ex available. So when we say food security, and, and, uh, and we express our desire that every person in this country will achieve the condition of food security. That's actually a term that describes the availability, so it is about supply, but also the accessibility of that supply, the affordability of that supply, and the reliability of that supply uh, on a regular basis. So food insecurity is when we depart from that condition and uh, organizations uh, such as uh, Feeding America are frontline. I just uh, was texting back and forth with a dear friend of mine at Feeding America who says their food pantry demand is up 60% since COVID hit. And, and many of those um, who are accessing services are accessing these services for the first time, rural, urban, many more veterans in that population than previous. And uh, so the condition of food insecurity is the condition we're really hoping to change. You know, I just want to, this is, when, you, when you're talking about this, when you talk about insecurity, I, sometimes I just feel that this is what the situation is in other developing countries that I've been to. It's pretty shocking, you know, that the United States has have something with the word insecurity attached to food, which I associate with people stealing it or they not being able to be, you know, uh, uh, you know you know, given to people to, to uh, um, to, you know, to send into neighborhoods and to communities and country to country. And the other one too, that's really shocking is when you put the word military into this idea of insecurity and food, and we'll talk to COVID, what's happened to COVID a little bit later, but I want to go to, to Shannon too, because you've done a lot of the, the studying about it. I'd love to have what the data is in terms of how this insecurity uh, and the shortage of food has, has impacted the military compared to the civilian world. Absolutely, and thanks so much for having me today. We started looking at food insecurity among military families back in 2017, and we were pretty surprised with what we saw. And in 2019, we fielded a survey where we asked people uh, the questions that are part of the USDA six item short food security scale, which really helped us understand not only um, if people are food insecure, but also where they were falling on that scale. 
And unfortunately, before COVID, we found that one in eight of our survey respondents was food insecure. That number really threw us back. We were not expecting uh, to have that many military families. Again, this is before COVID experiencing food insecurity. And when we peeled it back and we took a look at, you know, who among those respondents are food insecure, it was the veteran population. And it was also the junior and middle enlisted population that were experiencing food insecurity at the highest frequency, according to our survey respondents. We were also able to take a close look at geographic locations and places where the food insecurity is higher among our survey respondents and places like Fort Hood, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord, and then also um, down at uh, Fort Bragg in Norfolk, we were seeing really high um, frequency of food insecurity among those respondents. And so it's really surprising. Uh, we are in the process right now of fielding a survey to look at what's happening related to COVID. But these pre-COVID numbers tell us that there is an issue here and that military families really, um, in many cases, are experiencing food insecurity. I'm just I'm just curious while you're still talking about this is why is it that those particular bases are the ones where these these numbers are, are so bad? Is there a particular reason for that? That's what we don't know. And that's what we are going to be looking at as an organization. So we're in the process of doing some research this year that will really uncover what are those underlying factors that are bringing people to the point of being food insecure? What are their journeys and how can we map that out so that we can put interventions in place ideally before they get to the point of being food insecure, uh, so they don't have to experience that at all. But we really don't know those causal factors at this point from you know true data perspective, and we really need to take a look at that um, before we, you know, we jump to conclusions as far as you know mismanagement of money or whatever the situation might be. Because there are a lot of things that military families go through that we might not expect related to frequent moves, related to difficulty of spouse employment, and when you layer those things on top of each other, it creates a problem. And so we're going to be really looking at that uh, in depth this year. So let's, let's, turn, let's turn to uh, Blue Star Families and Kathy, because this is, uh, this is one that the pandemic seems to have changed a lot. You know, sometimes since we're, we're in the world of, of, of veterans and wars, at least our Iraq and Afghanistan, which has been the, the main focus of the veterans from those two wars uh, for our foundation. Is that you know we've always talked about the the physical wounds versus the invisible wounds and why the invisible wounds have opened up a whole uh, new number of more confusing problems we've had to deal with on these two wars because lives are saved so well but there's so many invisible wounds and now we've got this one that's another invisible wound which is COVID. What are the what are the reactions from the family and how are families themselves trying to deal with with the impact from COVID in terms of uh, food security. COVID's had a real impact on military families and that's included with food security. And it's not because people are getting sick from COVID because <clears throat> certain members and families aren't getting sick, but the second and third order effects, the fact that folks have had their moves uh, disrupted. So they may be paying two mortgages or two rents. They've had service members supposed to come back from deployment who didn't because of stop movement orders. And probably most significantly, military spouse unemployment, which was already insanely high, steady state 22, 24% for the last 10 years, is over 30% now with most of the people who were working before either not working at all anymore or with their hours reduced. And that's meant that military families are really facing financial insecurity and what we're seeing is that those numbers that um, Shannon referenced from all their good work and research, we're seeing this fall post COVID that the numbers have really jumped and they've expanded. So higher ranks of people are experiencing food insecurity now. And the veterans in our samples are experiencing food insecurity now. 30% of junior enlisted in our um, annual military family lifestyle survey fielded this fall was having food insecurity either um, low or very low, but even up to the senior enlisted, the most very highest rank um, non-commissioned officer, we had 8% of those folks with food insecurity. So we just, that, that kind of takes us a little bit to, uh, to homelessness. And Catherine, I'll turn to Catherine for this, that um, you know, I suppose we don't really think about those certainly that are active when you talk about homelessness, but those that are no, long, no longer active, what is the condition around because of COVID and homelessness? We hear a lot of you know suicide. We hear 
uh, food insecurity. But what about homelessness and certainly what that is causing in terms of, of food insecurity? Well, I think one of the interesting things is that food insecurity and housing instability truly go hand in hand, right? I mean, oftentimes there is a financial crisis or something that causes them both to occur together. Now, what we've seen a lot of since the start of the pandemic is that there has been massive investment from the federal government in creating more solutions for housing and getting people off the streets quickly because of you know the need to shelter in place and that being near impossible to do because of COVID. But I think the kind of incremental patchwork of solutions that we've been able to really rely on in the housing space hasn't necessarily materialized in the same way for veterans when you look at veteran food insecurity. You know, what our, what our mission really has been from the beginning when we started, what, what we're doing, you know, 14, it's, kind of, it's hard to believe it was just last week that it was 15th, a live day for me, it was 15 years since I was hit. But from the very beginning, our mission was to try to, you know, get people to find a place where they would want to put their donations and their, their love and their commitment to veterans that are, that are suffering. In the very beginning, it was largely about some type of medical problems they need. And then of course, the, when they then moving to the communities to get home and there was not enough attention and, and any kind of assistance from there. And now we've got so much with, with COVID that, that's happening. What is, what is the ability to think people could find a good place to help on this topic of, of food shortage or food, in, food insecurity for the veterans that are out right now? If anybody has any recommendations, I'd like to go to the, the entire team here to see if there's people have ideas about what's the best way for people to do it, because that's what the ones watching this right now would love to know. I mean, as far as ways people can lean in, I think it's often making sure people are connected to their resources locally. So there are so many things that happen at the national level and that's remarkable and wonderful. But part of what Bob Woodruff Foundation does that's so important is make sure that people are connected to the local resources and making sure that those local resources are empowered with the best ways to support their communities. Because while we can all talk about things at the national level and we can study things and, and put solutions and systems in place, a lot of it comes down to local implementation. What we're doing as an organization is we're taking that into consideration as far as how we address this and looking at Texas in particular first. What's happening in Texas? And once we can figure out what's happening in Texas, how can we scale that to other locations? So we can, you know, we can talk about this at the national level, but where the rubber really meets the road is when it comes down to the local level and how people get that local support. I think that's a great point, Shannon, and I'd love to jump in as well. People often think of food pantries and we love food pantries and are extremely grateful to them. But we see in our survey that one of the biggest barriers to food security for our families is the shame and embarrassment associated with it. And only one in five of our families who are experiencing food insecurity say that they have visited those. Um, I think there's a lot of innovative opportunity at the local level to meet people where they are. Um, one example in the Washington DC area, Blue Star Families has chapters around the country and we've partnered with Every Mind, and we're giving $100 grocery store um, gift cards to families who are in our community, in our network, they can take those cards. They're not going to a food pantry. They're choosing their own food. They don't look different than their neighbors and they're able to access help that way. So I think it's important to, um, to do everything and go everywhere. The food pantries are great. Policy change is great, but at the local level, look at what's happening um, creatively in your local communities um, to see how you can meet people where they are. You know, just to hear the hear the word stigma, that's, you know, that was what we talked about in terms of getting, you know, any type of, you know, physical or, or mental care when you came back from the wars. That was, mm -hmm. I think the stigma number was about 90% did not want to talk about what they, what kind of conditions they've gone into because some kind of wound from Iraq and Afghanistan. And then it completely flipped around and some, not quite that, it wasn't that that good. You know, it wasn't like ninety percent wanted to to admit it and talk about it. But it was just finally it took time before people got past these stigmas for uh, having been wounded in the war. I think Molly, you're about to say something. 
I was. Um, I have the privilege of volunteering on a regular basis at, um, at the Madison Vet Center. And this is a great example of, an, of a local institution that is veterans serving veterans. And uh, there, are, um, there are lots of different ways the community can support um, vet centers, which were specifically um, d built out uh, around the country and, and are uh, more and more and wider and wider dispersal of them, of their activities um, have really, it's really accelerated. Um, that these, these represent um, kind of hubs for veteran services across um, different kinds of needs. And uh, I'm sure your local vet center, if you've got one, could use your support. Does anybody, does anybody think that this will be uh, helped significantly or maybe we can kind of reverse it of the impact of what's going on with COVID on, on food insecurity? Do you think it will be able to fix pretty well before COVID goes away and people you know, stop you know, being exposed to it and then the numbers for COVID don't continue to, uh, to go up? Do you think there's a way this will be better even while COVID is a massive problem in our country? I think that part of this is people are less intimidated to you know, talk about it. Um, one of the silver linings of COVID and this situation is that people are a lot more open and, and people are you know, sharing their stories. We're finding that people are being very open with us as far as what they're going, going through. And we're able to connect them to resources more quickly because they are being open as far as their experiences. And, you know, I, we talk about stigma and in the military and veteran space, there's this culture of resilience. You know, I'm okay. I'm not going to take the support because there might be someone who needs it more than me. And, you know, right now it's just such a widespread issue. And we really want to encourage people, if you, if you need the support, please take it. You know, these systems and resources are in place for a reason and make sure that you're not only you know, getting the help that you need, but you're also sharing that information with other people who might need it because you never know who needs to hear the information as far as what those support systems could be uh, locally and at, and at the national level. Things like pandemic EBT. Uh, I don't think that many people know about it. They don't know it's a resource. They don't know that if their child out of school and they had been on free and reduced price meals, that this is a great resource for them. And it's something that we can all play a role in from a communications perspective and getting the word out and breaking down the stigma um, perceived or real that might be there for many families. I think Bob, Shannon, I think, oh. Go ahead, Kathy. I think Shannon makes a great point about the opportunity that COVID gives us. One of the things we've seen in our surveys is that military and veteran families are feeling less disconnected from the civilian families in their community because they're all going through something together, which does give us an opportunity to, to, to go forward more strongly. It, it's important to recognize that most military connected people while serving or in, as veterans are part of families and families in America who are middle class and working class need two incomes. So there's a systemic problem that won't be fixed by COVID. Um, everyone on this uh, call could call their Congress people and ask for military connected people to be eligible for SNAP without having their housing allowance accounted, that, that stops a lot of people from getting support. One other thing I did wanna mention that we are seeing among our veteran respondents, 12% in our survey, by the way, have food insecurity, is that that number is higher for African-American veterans. And they are not equally receiving um, support um, as well, we know. So there's, there's more work that needs to be done to really meet the need. So is that, do you know exactly why that was, is that partly because of the vulnerability for, for COVID uh, as opposed to the way they're treated within the military? You know, one of the things we're learning as we have a Boost Our Families launched a racial equity initiative is that military support organizations and veteran support organizations, their memberships are disproportionately white, their staffs and their boards are disproportionately white. And Social science tells us that when people don't see themselves represented, they don't think those organizations for the, are for them. So we're seeing in our surveys that African-American and other military and veteran families of color are less aware of the support and resources that are out there for us. And again, I think that highlights for us that we need to change ourselves. We need to change how we do our work in order to meet those families who are on an equal 
field as far as what they need. So they should be an equal field as far as what they get. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm curious that the 12% uh, the number of insecurity, food insecurity that is felt, that's that's within the, the military. No, uh, that's the veteran population. Or, or the whole thing. Is there a number within the veterans that are about the same? Or is it uh, different? Yeah, so for veterans solely, the number is 12% overall. For um, the military, if you pull out you know, like, so for instance, like Shannon's um, uh, had a particular population, her survey in the military. For us, when we pull out, we, we don't have, we do have some food and security. People are surprised, but even among junior officers. Um, so that it does still exist there. It's keenest among junior enlisted. But we had almost 30%, 29% in our, our fall survey. But even among senior enlisted, who are people in their 30s and early 40s, 8% food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Kathy's saying. And even when you pull apart the veteran population and you look at their time in service, if they hit that 20 year mark and they retired, we're seeing less likeliness of food insecurity. But it's those who are post 9 11 who didn't you know, meet the 20 year threshold, who aren't getting that pension, who have different support systems in place, they are uh, more likely to be experiencing food insecurity, according to uh, MFAN's research as well. Molly, do you have any, Molly, since you've been uh, looking at, you've been doing this for your, your whole career, really, if you, were, if you were to look at these developing countries, I asked you about a little bit earlier, uh, comparing to what's happening now in the United States in terms of uh, insecure, food insecurity. Um, well, many of the, the uh, dynamics we're seeing in the United States, um, increases in poverty levels, which is intimately tied to uh, levels of security and uh, joblessness, we're, we're expecting that the number of food insecure people worldwide may double by the end of the pandemic. Uh, so we are seeing very consequential reverses um, that were in place over decades where we saw steady improvement in the reduction of poverty and steady improvement in food insecurity. Around 2015, actually, there was an inflection um, where we began to see uh, food insecurity and actually famine start to rise again. So we were going into COVID from a relatively vulnerable place and COVID has made everything much worse globally. Uh, and in many, and of course, the more vulnerable the country, the more acute the crisis. But to go back to the silver linings of COVID in the United States, um, COVID laid bare the fragility of U.S. food uh, distribution systems because uh, for the first time in COVID, regular people walked into their grocery store and saw bare shelves. And so I am hoping that we can take the uh, attention, including of Craig, Craig's attention, because a injecting nimbleness into the way food supply uh, and distribution systems in the United States work could go a long way towards doing a better job moving food into food assistance. Uh, and again, Feeding America has seen demand spike 60% right here in the United States. Um, so we're not, we, we, stunningly, the United States is not that different from uh, some of the dynamics in the developing world. And we're seeing dire conditions here and there. I know I spoke uh, to you about this before that you know, I guess there's some countries where there is a shortage of production of food, but really in our country, it's not production, it's more, as you said, the delivery of it. And then now with COVID, it's just people can't afford to buy it, even if it's delivered. Is there, which of those do you think is, should be the first priority to fix? Well, some colleagues and I went to work when COVID hit in March because we knew at the same time we were seeing these terrible spikes in demand for food assistance, we were seeing um, collapse of food service demand and uh, breakdowns in processing structure facilities due to COVID in meat processing plants. And so um, I can imagine, and some others have been working towards this, almost like a Craigslist in the commercial food distribution networks so that when a, a market disappears quickly, it's possible to quickly reform that link in the supply chain and get that food somewhere good. 
So uh, we saw milk dumping. We saw um, euthanized animals dumped in landfills during at exactly the time when we most needed to have that food moving into the hands of food insecure Americans. And that is just not okay. So I'm hoping that, mm -hmm. um, that for example, having Craig Newmark's attention on this issue, a uh, Craig's list in these commercial distribution systems could make a big difference in the nimbleness with which we can reform links, especially for perishables, protein, produce, and dairy, which is um, which is the the cornerstone of healthy diets. Yeah. Anybody else on that? You know, you know, because I, I was uh, that Molly mentioned about food delivery, because I think one of the challenges that veterans experiencing homelessness often face is getting to food and getting to the store if they're able to have the benefits to afford it. And one of the interesting things that we've really seen in the pandemic is organizations innovating, right, and trying different things. So we've got members across the country who are partnering with HelloFresh and delivering actual meal kits to veterans without transportation or folks that are opening up their food pantry more often, or even VA medical centers out there that have, you know, monthly food pantries in the lobby that any veteran can come in and, you know, partake of with fresh food. And so I think, you know, now is a really great time to think about what kind of innovative solutions are really moving the needle in communities and looking to replicate them. I can give a shout out to Feeding Illinois. So Feeding America has statewide uh, organizations and the head of Feeding Illinois is really actively trying to connect uh, produce, uh, those that grow produce in Illinois with food banks directly so that the produce doesn't have to go from the farmer to the wholesaler, to the warehouse, to the grocery store to get old and tired and then finally get donated. But where there is not a good market, um, just get it right to food assistance. And I think that kind of nimbleness could, could really open up channels, um, both for donation and for purchase, because um, one of the challenges has been that while money flows in, it's flowing into organizations that are already slammed by spiking demand and uh, and you know they're lean organizations that don't necessarily have the infrastructure to handle these big influxes of both demand and cash. And so um, I'm hopeful that uh, it's a slower process. It's taken a lot longer than I thought it would uh, to get some of these um, these default plan B uh, mechanisms in place. but, um, there are a bunch of us, including dairy farmers of Wisconsin, that are really trying hard, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll see some at least small successes in diverting product quickly so it's not wasted. We haven't talked about how much food America wastes. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, you know, a, some people will say a third of what we produce we waste. And so a really important effort of food banks and pantries to date has been simply to try to capture that waste. I think we can do a lot better on that with the innovation that COVID is spurring. Absolutely, and I think that's also where partnerships become so key. So what we did in Texas, we hosted a food distribution event on December 22nd, and we worked with the food care center outside Fort Hood, and we brought them Food, right? So we partnered with organizations like Tyson Foods, like HEB, and we were able to bring them this massive influx of food, work within their infrastructure, and bring the military families there. And during that event, we served more than 500 military families a lot of food in a COVID safe environment uh, because we worked smart and we partner with organizations. Not all organizations need to be able to do all things. We need to be able to link up in smart ways so that we can get the support where it's needed in an expeditious way. And I think that that's, you know, a key opportunity that we're all kind of, you know, taking the time to take that step back and how can we work smarter so that we make sure that we are more efficient in getting the support where it's needed. Sh Shanna, because the number you said earlier was pretty stunning down there in Fort Hood is an example mm -hmm. of the worst hit, right, of all the bases in the country. Was it when you did something, did it change that that number much, or was it was it mostly delivery, which was the uh, was the was the problem that was causing this kind of insecurity, food insecurity? 
it's really hard to know. And what we are trying to do is while we study this issue, we also want to make sure that we're not saying, okay, great, tell us everything that's going on in your life and what's leading to you to the point of being food insecure. But we also want to help people, right, and get that immediate support to them so they can put food on the table. And so that's what we're really focused on right now. I don't think that you can really see meaningful data-driven impact uh, right away. We can say we fed 500 families that they were able to you know, eat and provide holiday meals and that's, that's wonderful. But as far as truly moving the needle, that takes, that takes real time. Um, and you know, I think that we have to also think about how we do this in a smart way. So we really tried to break down the stigma. And when we saw the cars pulling up you know, filled with kids, we made sure that we had Santa and Mrs. Claus there and we had a band there. And so these families are able to say, thank you so much. You know, I brought my kids to see Santa and Mrs. Claus without having to say, okay, kids, we're going, you know, to get food support. We can say, I'm going to see Santa. And the kids are really excited about that. And so I think that there are smart ways that we can approach this. We also, we got them the food and we introduced them to the food care center so that if they needed help after that event, They'd already been there. They know what it looks like. That 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 anxiety as far as the first visit was gone, and so that's been a really big um, you know path ahead for us as well. Shannon Coming makes up. a really important point about the role of the private sector. I I have just been so impressed by the extent to which so many big and small companies are stepping up to offer whatever it is they have. Maybe it's empty uh, refrigerated trailers uh, because we're having trouble with uh, cold storage for fluid milk that families need. For, um, maybe it's donated product. Maybe it's donated transportation services. But the private sector, I think, has stepped up um, in a number of important ways. And the more partnership, the more guidance they have with organizations on the ground, the more likely it is that that help actually moves the needle on the condition. Um, our veterans families and military families and the rest of America is facing. You know, Shanna, you say you talked about the kids. I mean, if you, if you think about that topic too, have, have there been studies on how the kids have been impacted by this in terms of food uh, insecurity? I know we all know it's the parents that you know, are in charge of that, but, but is there a psychological study? I mean, not studies, but have there, have there, is there some data on how this is hurt? kids and everyone's got some yeah. personal stories I'm sure everybody here on the panel. I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I think that we're going to continue to learn about how COVID has impacted kids related to food and a lot of other issues. I was on a, a panel last week and I'm talking about things like emergency room visits. Well, those are way down for kids, but you have to ask the question, why? Why are those emergency room visits down? It's because they're not in school and they're not seeing people who can say, oh gosh, this you know child's presenting a sign of an issue. We need to get them help. And so I think that we're gonna continue to learn as far as what COVID has meant for children. Um, we worry a lot about those who re receive free and reduced price meals at school and that they're not getting the same type of support and just also how disparate the support has been. So a lot of it is inconsistent as far as how states are responding um, to getting people the support that they need. And it creates a confusing system for military families in many cases who are new to a state are trying to figure it out, don't have the childcare to you know, have the time to focus on something. And it's really creating this cascade effect that um, I think that we're gonna see the outcomes um, for a long time, unfortunately. One intervention that um, I know Feeding America is really anxious to support is um, the advocacy for a military family basic needs allowance that would provide actually a multi mo monthly stipend to military families whose income is below 130% of the federal poverty uh, level. And a, and a basic uh, backstop like that could be a help for, uh, the, for military families who are in those um, junior ranks where salaries are really awfully low for what it is they need to do. do does that have a, uh, a, a thoughts about what the government's doing enough on this? And we're talking about you know private support and projects you're talking about. What about the government? Are they were they just so quickly overwhelmed by it? They just didn't get around to dealing with 
and, and needs the uh, the private support more because it's, it took so time to react to it? You know, there's a couple things the government could do that would make an enormous difference right off the bat. And the number one mm -hmm. thing is stop counting the service members housing allowance as part of their income, which often makes them ineligible for SNAP benefits. Yet you have to have a house. And that doesn't mean you don't need food. And military folks are disadvantaged because because of the way you move and because of the demands on the service member schedule, it's very hard to have those two incomes. So you need both the house, but you also need money for food. And if we could simply change that, that would make a huge difference. But we also believe that our military has to understand we have a total family force. The vast majority of our service members who serve over time are married and have children. And the lack of predictability, stability, the lack of um, the ability to have input on the service member's schedule means that military spouses can't keep old careers. Um, and that sets up the veteran to have uh, uh, insecurity as well. So if we could solve it on the front end, structure ourselves to have a military that has families, remove the VAH limitations on SNAP eligibility, the downstream of effects would be enormous. SNAP is a very effective program, and uh, and so right after the pandemic hit, um, SNAP benefits were increased. But um, SNAP is really a, an extremely efficient way to take public dollars and get them delivered into the challenge of food insecurity. It happens as money, which is better than, uh, often works out logistically better, and also in terms of the issues of stigma, better than actual food. The veteran can purchase, or the, the recipient can purchase uh, what they want, and, like anyone else. So SNAP is a really, um, really valued and valuable program that um, could be an outlet for additional government support in terms of pandemic recovery. I think there's probably a government role for pushing more SNAP enrollment. When you look at the homeless veterans population and they do these, you know, food insecurity screeners at the medical centers, right? About half of them that are still reporting food insecurity are actually already enrolled in SNAP. And about 22% of them, I believe, are also using supplemental food resources. And so I think there's probably a role for, you know, thinking through how VA might play a stronger role in enrolling people in SNAP and then also you know, what more we could do to increase SNAP benefits and make them more responsive to the needs of the people who are using them. I mean, we've got right now, you know, thousands of veterans who are in hotels and motels who would have been out on the streets and they don't have kitchens. There's not a lot of refrigeration. And in some states, you can't use SNAP to purchase pre-prepared food. So the benefit isn't as useful to them as it might be for someone who's housed. And so I think you know, adding flexibility and creating um, a system that can really serve all would be of benefit to everyone in the country. And how many much, how much areas, do you think it's, no, go ahead, Molly. I was gonna say many of the areas, especially uh, where there is a relatively heavy population of those experiencing homelessness are food deserts. So the SNAP benefit doesn't work as well, of course, in an area where there aren't supermarkets or there aren't uh, stores that sell good quality food. And so this interaction between the location, so even when they're housed, they're housed in areas where it's difficult to purchase uh, supermarket quality food, even if they have the SNAP benefit. Yeah, how much, how much do you think the, the, the problem, why this is not working quite as well as we'd like it to work is how much is it's defective or how much because people just don't know about it. If you've got to apply to something or find something, it just doesn't have enough attention, which is really what we're trying to do right now on for this hour, is how many people just don't know about these possibilities for them to, to get through this uh, insecurity? I think it's both. You know, I think that there's definitely an awareness issue as far as the resources that have become available during COVID, uh, especially because many of those are, are newer or added support. But as far as what Kathy was mentioning, um, as far as how people in military families have access or don't have access to SNAP, that's a major problem. If you're having a hard time putting food on the table, you submit an application and then you're turned away. I mean, just think about the impact that that has on you from a social emotional perspective. You know, you see, you can't, you're having a hard time putting food on the table and you're being told, sorry, because you have a basic allowance for housing, sorry, because you're in the military, 
you don't, you're not eligible for this. And that's just, it's gotta be a, you know, a gut wrenching experience. No one should be experiencing food insecurity, but to be told that because you have this housing allowance, you're ineligible, it's a major problem. Yes. We also um, saw people telling us that they find the application process is really confusing. The qualification um, requirements uh, can undermine their confidence and it, it cannot seem like it's worth the time to try to go through all that with the risk it might not work out. And I think that goes back to the human centered design. What's the experience of the person? And maybe you're a little depressed to begin with because your finances are tight and you're not where you wanna be in life. To make it so hard to get help um, pounds it. Yeah, we saw in our research, again, before COVID, that there was a connection between loneliness, using the UCLA loneliness scale, and food insecurity. And, you know, when you think about it, that makes sense. So if you're food insecure, you might be becoming more recluse and not, you know, engaging as much because you don't have the money to do that. But now imagine during COVID, when loneliness is a real part of all of our lives, and then you bring food insecurity on top of it, Again, these second and third order effects, I think that we're going to be seeing and feeling them for a long time. And we have to think through how can we get people that support now because it's going to impact a lot of different areas of their lives and their children's lives. And when we think about the actively serving force, we know that military kids are more likely to wear the uniform in the future. And so how can we make sure that we are raising healthy military children who have access to you know, healthy nutritional food so that if they do choose uh, to, to join the military in the future, they're doing it from a place of, you know, a healthy, um, you know, nutrition filled life. Is, is there a location? You know, I mean, Shannon, Catherine, Kathy, Kathy, I think you probably have something within your organizations where people could, I guess, get online and find out how to uh, at least research or find some place to, you know, to apply to things or to get recommendations. Are, do you have any advice on what people could do online? Sure. We have a program called Mill Map, and you can go in and type in your zip code, and it's populated with all of the Feeding America food banks. Uh, we have information on our website about pandemic EBT, and we're really trying to make sure that it's easy to connect people, like I mentioned before, to the local support and the yeah. local resources. And we all have to make sure that we, as organizations, are also sharing information and referring people where appropriate so that, you know, it doesn't matter who's getting people to support, it matters that the family gets the support. And so we're really focused on uh, being that conduit for families to whatever the best resources that's out there for them and whatever they might be needing. Um, at Blue Star Families, we have um, 11 physical chapters in cities around the country, and um, we have a national chapter for if you're outside of those 11 areas. And we try to create a lifestyle of health that connects military and veteran families into their civilian neighbors through um, re resilience building activities, but then it helps get people to support. So we have food insecurity programs at each of those that are, don't look like food insecurity programs. They They just look like fun and uh, positive building activities. We have a MOU with the VA so that we can help create connections there too. So we really encourage people to come to us and uh, let us help them and bring them into the community and into the family. So at NCHV, our map really focuses in on housing resources, but we do have a toll free referral line and it's 1-800-VET-HELP and people call it and we refer them back to organizations in their community and. I mean, the referrals aren't specific to housing, right? I mean, sometimes they're legal services, employment, um, food banks, what have you, whatever we can find that they need. I know the economy has been so slaughtered by uh, by COVID and all that. What's, uh, just for, give me give me the honest answer. <laughs> How has fundraising been for your organizations and what's been the feedback from people that have benefited from it? I, you know, I think that there's a lot of questions right now. You know, we've had a, a successful year. And we've been able to deploy more support for families. But I think that there's a lot of unknowns right now as far as what that's going to look like long term. And people who can, I think, really are trying to do everything they possibly can to support. We heard people who received you know, stimulus money who said, we don't need it. We're going to donate it. And those are the types of things, just people helping people that really do help us all move the needle, whatever organization we're part of. And um, so, I, you know, I, I think a lot remains to be seen. Um, but people like Craig Newmark, who are, you know, sharing their incredible, um, you know, wealth and generosity to allow all of us to really lean in 
in a really unclear, uncertain time, I think it's really important. And it's also very meaningful. It, you know, it, it kind of takes you back to think, okay, these people are, are doing what they can. And that's, that's really powerful. At Blue Star Families, we experienced a 20% membership growth this past year, I think because people were really looking for avenues for support. And um, we're fortunate to grow that much in, in our fundraising as well. And certainly we're lucky, uh, Craig Newmark has been on our board in the past and he's been a real leader. Um, those partnerships are everything. The demand is very high for the kinds of things that all of us do. So we have to keep finding those great partners. Bob Woodruff Foundation has been a great partner to us as well. Um, and I think that's how we all grow stronger. And I think we're seeing people step up with their skills as well. Um, so I'm, I am really hopeful that Craig will turn his attention to some of the really actually pretty stupid things about the way the US food supply and distribution systems work, because he figured out a pretty way for us to buy and sell all sorts of things uh, we need in our communities. And a similar play, I think, resides in our food system. And that could leave lasting, long lasting and profound benefits for all of us. Well, uh, maybe perhaps that's the way to, to end this talk right now with a, another thank you to uh, Craig who started this whole show here with uh, another amazing uh, piece of evidence of generosity from him. I was I was told to go until till 155, and so that's what we did. <laughs> so I just want to thank everybody that's been here. Um, sir, you know, Anne Marie's been remarkable running our foundation. Craig, you know, what what else can we say? You know, uh, Molly, Catherine, Shannon, Kathy. I just want to thank all of you for coming here and participating with us. Um, you know, this has been about the most fulfilling kind of work that I think uh, we, all of us have ever done in our lives, do something for other people. And, you know, you don't you don't have to uh, you don't have to pray to uh, to know what kind of impact that has on people. But I just want to thank all of you there. And I think if I got it right, I think I'm going to hand it over to Meg now to kind of close the show. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to each of our esteemed panelists. And of course, thank you to Craig Newmark for your generous support, which was impressive even before today's announcement. Um, I'm, I'm struck by how unfortunate it is that virtual applause is so unsatisfying. Um, in the Zoom world, it, it's hard to um, express the energy of all the people that have joined us today. And this has been such a great conversation. So again, thank you to our panelists. I'm Meg Harrell. I'm the Chief Program Officer of the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And we're very pleased to bring this first panel of our Leaders Eat Last discussion series to you. And we're thrilled that so many of you joined us today. Thank you all for your time and your attention to this important issue. Our intent with this first panel was really to discuss the basic elements of food insecurity with experts. So from Molly John, we heard the difference between food insecurity and hunger. You know, food insecurity is more entrenched. It's more challenging to address but solutions are more enduring when we resolve food insecurity rather than just hunger. We also learned that food insecurity in our country is especially frustrating because it's not due to famine, it's not due to a lack of food, it's an economic issue, but it's also a supply and distribution issue. So broadly, philanthropy exists to catch people when they fall through the established safety nets of our systems. And that's really where we are today with food insecurity. In that vein, this discussion also highlighted some of the failures of our systems. Our panelists helped us understand the gaps in public programs that have produced this urgency for, for Craig Newmark and for the Bob Woodruff Foundation. I'm especially struck by Catherine's mention of public policy to prevent homelessness. We all know about the eviction moratoriums to prevent homelessness. Catherine's underscored to us before that there's no hunger moratorium in our country. And Kathy and Shannon both confirmed what for many of us is unthinkable, that not only veterans, but families with uniformed service members, those currently serving, are struggling to eat. And that's not just junior enlisted personnel, but young officers and senior NCOs as well. I know from reading Shannon's organization study that military family members are eating ice to avoid the symptoms of hunger. These are families who selflessly serve our country 
And as part of their selflessness, they're reluctant to request help for themselves. And when they do, they're often ineligible. So the Bob Woodruff Foundation finds, funds, shapes, and accelerates best-in-class programs to ensure that military and veteran families thrive. We're steadfast in our enduring commitment to meet the needs of this population. We're currently granting to organizations that reach and serve this population with a special focus on food insecurity. We plan to use the lessons from this discussion series to inform our grants. We absolutely feel the need to address hunger, but we also plan to invest in upstream solutions that will address food insecurity and compounding problems. Because if a family does not have a kitchen and cooking utensils and running water, then boxes of pasta and rice and beans don't help them. So with the generous support of Craig Newmark, we're doing all that we can to address and eradicate food insecurity in the military and veteran community. And in the meantime, we'll continue to learn. Our next Leaders Eat Last session will discuss the linkage between food insecurity and both mental health and physical health. And I'm confident that it will be as important a discussion as today's was. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again the beginning of March for our next discussion.